And we can begin with the with the uh, homage, refuges, and precepts. So as we begin with uh, prepare ourselves to enter into practice, let's um, let's ground ourselves in this body, being supported in this moment by Mother Earth. Honoring the, the generosity uh, and our, our deep interconnection, interdependence, interbeing with the Earth with all the elements, honoring the ancestral peoples who have walked this land, known this land, and known their own deep interconnection with the life around them uh, and continue to do so uh, here in Montreal, uh, the, uh, the um, Kiankahaga people's name for Montreal is Chichaga. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that well. Um, I'm really learning to understand what it means to honor these ancestral peoples and, um, and, and all of the um, peoples who have arrived in the, uh, in the millennia, in the, in the centuries, in the decades um, leading up to the present moment. Uh, many people coming to this land uh, because of persecution, because of, of uh, famine, starvation. Also people coming to exploit the people and deny the existence of the ancestral peoples, the indigenous peoples who already inhabited in uh, in complex and sophisticated civilizations here. Um, and um, you know, the blindness of the colonizers uh, is, is tragic and heartbreaking and has and caused great damage, which continue to this day. Also honoring the ancestors of these uh, that have brought us these spiritual teachings um, through millennia, um, many different countries, many different languages and cultures, uh, which engage, who engaged and explored and deepened and developed the Dharma. Um, in their own practice, in their own realizations. Uh, we owe them so much. And we're part of these lineages. We're part of these, these evolutions of humanity, of spiritual practice. Uh, as we engage in practice, as we engage in living with a heart that seeks justice and compassion, um, our story becomes woven into the big story and, and it matters. Our stories matter, each one of us. Our lives matter, our choices matter. 
Uh, we are part of the unfolding development of human life and Dharma. And I think we can bring this, all of this understanding to uh, what we, uh, how we approach the honoring the Buddha, the taking refuge and the, and the um, reaffirmation of our commitment to live ethically and kindly, um, reducing the harm as we can, as much as we can uh, to, um, to live harmoniously. So I invite you to, to chant with me or to, to just listen and contemplate uh, the chants, the intentions, uh, to read the English if you like. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sammasambuddhasa. Udang saranang gachami, tamang saranang gachami, sanghang saranang Kachami Duti Ampi Budang Sarnang Kachami Duti Ampi Damang Sarnang Kachami Dati Duti Ampi Sangam Sarnang Kachami Tati ampi budang sarnang gachami. Tati ampi damang sarnang gachami. Tati ampi sangang sarnang gachami. Taking refuge in Buddha. The, all the ways that we can experience Buddha as, as is repeated in the Satipatthana Sutta internally and externally. We can experience Buddha in recollecting the historical Buddha and in, in touching into that openness, awareness, presence of wisdom and compassion which is alive in us and which we are cultivating, opening to, allowing to shine forth and, and around us. The more we can touch into and honor the inner Buddha, the Buddha alive within us, the more that we can also see the Buddha alive in those around us. So that when we look at somebody you know, what do we see? Do we see somebody that we have to deal with? Uh, do we see somebody who annoys us? Do we see somebody that we love? Uh, do we see the Buddha? So all of these are possibilities. And, and when we can see the inner Buddha and the Buddha around us, uh, that inner and outer begins to um, become more transparent, permeable, um, insubstantial. We see our deep interconnectedness.
and uh, a very important way that we honor the, the sacredness of each life is to affirm our commitment to living with an attitude of non-harming. Panati pata veramani sikapadam samadhiyami. Adina dana veramani sikapadam samadhiyami. Kame su mi chattara veramani sikapadam samadhiyami. Usawada veramani sikapadam samadhiyami. Sura Maria Maja Pamadatana Veramani Sikapadam Samadhiyami Ida Misila Maga Fala Nyanasa Pachayo Hotu Sadu Sadhu, sadhu, anumodami. So in this affirmation of our intention to live with, with compassion and kindness, uh, refraining from harming and cultivating goodness, cultivating support for life and generosity. Um, and, uh, and speaking the truth. Um, and, uh, and turning away from addictions and um, and misuse of our erotic uh, energies. This brings joy. I rejoice, I rejoice. These ethical practices and virtuous practices, cultivation of virtuous qualities, they bring joy. I'd like to also, uh, as we begin our, our practice, I'd like to dedicate our practice to um, those in Turkey and Syria who are suffering, um, suffering uh, the, uh, the death, the loss, un just unimaginable um, of the earthquakes that, that have happened there and are uh, it's just, you know, just can we carry that in our hearts with compassion, with, with a kind of prayer and wishing well and uh, and to whatever extent we can perhaps contribute to uh, the work that's being done there. Um, and perhaps if you 
if anybody has any uh, personal connection with anyone there, uh, knows anyone there or, or in those countries um, who has uh, emigrated from those countries, uh, perhaps holding them in, in a special way because uh, you know, we know how deeply we're touched by tragedies, by loss, um, when we have a personal connection. So, um, so uh, yeah, so I'd like to, uh, so we've been, um, as you know, we've been uh, exploring the Satipatthana Sutta since September and, um, We've uh, explored, I mean, and you know, we could just go deeper and deeper. It's, it's such, there's so much in this discourse and uh, it's, uh, yeah, it is, it is really um, such a deep teaching. Uh, as the Buddha said, it's a, it's a complete teaching. Um, uh, oh yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I noticed that Chatel just uh, went and came back, and I, I just um, I want to apologize for what happened last week. Those of you who were here, I Bell, there was all these internet outages that were happening uh, on and off, and and I guess I, I considered, I counted myself lucky to have gotten as far as I did, very close to the end. Um, yeah. I, I'd like to just, uh, I, I know I, I didn't, I, I, I was worried that everybody would get cut, cut off, but I just would like to ask if I could, um, you know, make someone a co-host, uh, not asking you to do anything, but just to ensure that if I do get um, cut off that, uh, that there's somebody who's kind of holding the space. So, um, if anybody feels comfortable with that, um, you know, one of the regulars, I, I know, Carol, are you, would you be comfortable if I just named you co-host? If you're, if you're, uh, if your internet is stable. <laughs> okay. Uh, when I'm here, I don't know that I'm, I'm, I'm at every single one. No, no, well, it, 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 I, I would just name whoever's here. You know. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, with pleasure. Just thank for today. Yeah, with pleasure. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, just, uh, I'll just, I'll just try to remember to do that at the beginning of the meeting to say, you know, somebody who's kind of a regular and might be comfortable with um, uh, holding that. Um, I'm just, um, I'm sorry, Daryl, it's Melanie, hi. Uh, it's just to let you know that we kept going. Huh? I don't know if you know that, but we kept going till 12.15. Yeah, you... yeah, Carol okay. sent me an email and told okay. me. I was so glad to hear that, that, that you uh, took the initiative and just kept on with the discussion. It's like, yes, <laughs> that's Sangha. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, so as I was saying, uh, we've been moving through the Satipatthana Sutta, and 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 so um, I I worked last week with mind objects and and talked about how cultivating uh, sorry me, uh, mental states, not today's mind objects. Um, mental states, and I talked about how, you know, there's the noticing of the arising of mental states, and they're seeing the arising and the passing away. Um, and uh, um, I'm just going to change this, the view, just to be sure that it's not recording the gallery. I don't think it is. Um, yeah. Uh, 
I just got a, a weird pop up that uh, I've been signed out, but I'm still here. So, phew. <laughs> um, so, doesn't help the train of thought when those things happen. Um, yeah. So, so that we can notice, we can be mindful of the mental states that arise and pass away. And that's really important and that we, we be aware with an open heart uh, if there are skillful states, afflictive states, beautiful states of heart. And we can also, as part of this uh, cultivation, we can call forth these states, we can develop these states. And I, I was emphasizing metta last time and, um, uh, you know, and I think it's the more, the more we touch into metta, the more we invite metta, the more metta shows up in, in, in our lives. Uh, and it has a beautiful healing and transforming effect uh, I've found in my life, in my practice that, um, that yeah, touching into that just, quality of love, just simplicity of, of welcoming every part of who I am now into this presence of love um, is, is very, uh, very supportive uh, also of the cultivation of, of discernment and wisdom, um, knowing that some states are painful and some states are happy and that, you know, we're wanting to cultivate happiness for ourselves and for others. Um, and so we approach uh, this next chapter, this next section of the Satipatthana, the same attitude of, of love and compassion um, cultivation of dhammas and uh, most um, teachers I know now prefer to leave the word dhammas untranslated because the the translation mind objects um, is really it's too much of an emphasis on the mental reality it's it's not just mental, it's, it's, it's holistic, it's body mind. Like when, for, for example, the, the section begins with looking at the hindrances. These are afflictive states. Um, and, and when we experience the hindrances, uh, it's not just a mental experience, it's a body mind experience. Uh, body, heart, mind. Um, and so I'd like to read just this section on contemplation of mind objects, including uh, the refrain that is repeated in every one of the sections. So, um, so contemplation of, of dhammas, um, you know, and we can think of these, one of these, one of the ways that I, I think of my understanding of dhammas is um, like frameworks or formations um, that we use to uh, perceive and understand our experience. Um, and we, so, so a framework, we can name, we experience something and we can name a, it as a hindrance. Um, naming it is a certain kind of experience of, uh, of knowing it, um, but it's not the deepest 
level of knowing it, knowing it holistically, knowing it in the heart and the body uh, is part of how we know it and, um, and are aware of it. And, and mindfulness is another way of saying awareness. So, uh, the, the, so the first, um, there's a whole list of different frameworks or dhammas that we go through in this chapter. And, um, and the first one is the five hindrances. And how bhikkhus does a bhikkhu abide contemplating mind objects as mind objects or dhammas as dhammas? Here a bhikkhu abides and your bhikkhus, we're all bhikkhus, practitioners. Here a bhikkhu abides contemplating dhammas as dhammas in terms of the five hindrances. And how does a bhikkhu abide contemplating dhammas as dhammas in terms of the five hindrances. Here, there being a sensual desire in one, bhikkhu understands there's a sensual desire in me. Or there being no sensual desire, one understands there's no sensual desire in me. And one also understands how there comes to be the arising of unarisen sensual desire. And when and how there comes to be the abandoning of arisen sensual desire, and how there comes to be the future non-arising of abandoned sensual desire. I'm gonna read that again, because uh, it's really key in this section is the conditionality that not only are we noticing, oh, there's grasping, you know, or there's anger, we're, but we're also looking at the causality. We're looking at what are the conditions that gave rise to this? So that's really cultivating discernment and wisdom. And I want to emphasize again and again that this is rooted in compassion. It's not rooted in judgment. It's not rooted in, I have to get rid of sensual desire that's evil that's you know it's it's really it's not that that mind state is not helpful it's this this uh, practice is rooted in a deep knowing what brings happiness and what brings suffering so one also understands how there comes to be the arising of unarisen sensual desire. So what does that mean? Like a moment ago, I was just feeling kind of fine, you know, neutral, open. I was whatever, uh, sitting, meditating, eating my breakfast, watering the plants, whatever. And then something arose in me, uh, a thought or a sensation. Something arose and that, you know, when we look back at the second Satipatthana, the feeling, Vedna, um, when we look back, at the dependent origination, we recognize that it was a feeling tone, some kind of feeling tone, pleasant, unpleasant, um, or possibly neutral, but more likely pleasant or unpleasant, that in the absence of awareness, in the absence of mindfulness, gave rise to some kind of grasping, sensual desire or aversion or one of the other hindrances. And so, um, but now we're focusing on, on sensual desire. So, so one understands how there comes to be the arising of unarisen sensual desire. So it wasn't there before and now it is. And how there comes to be the abandoning 
of arisen sensual desire. So, so if we're mindful, we're recognizing, oh, you know, that a thought of whatever, having a piece of chocolate, buying something, uh, something that, you know, I don't need, it wasn't in my mind, it's not coming out of necessity, it just arose and now I'm, the mind is kind of getting entangled with it, creating narrative, so, so grasping moves into clinging and we have a whole story and then a, then a self develops, a, a sense of self develops around it. So that wisdom that we bring, that insight, you know, or simply mindfulness of suffering, like, oh, there's a contraction. Uh, and uh, it wasn't there before, and now I'm contracting, and now I'm obsessing. Uh, so, um, so how there comes to be the abandoning of a reason central desire. So, you know, bringing wisdom and saying, ah, oh, this is a rise, this arose, and it it has the nature to pass away, uh, and. And the seeing of it and the recognizing of how it arose uh, allows us to let it go. Um, and how there comes to be the future non-arising of abandoned sensual desire. So the future non-arising means that over time, as we apply these practices, that these little contractions, these little hooks that we get grabbed by, they, uh, they, they diminish, they, their power over us uh, becomes less. So, so non-arising is like a kind of an aspirational uh, view perhaps, but more and more um, as they arise, we learn to not get caught and not to follow through and not to obsess. And, and we recognize that we have the capacity to let go. And so, um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's the journey. Um, and then, and then that is repeated in terms of all the five hindrances. So, um, ill will, sloth and torpor, doubt, uh, uh sorry, restlessness and remorse and doubt. So those are the five hindrances. The five hindrances are taught as um, a, a particular unit, a, you know, a, a number five. These are, you know, and so what does the word hindrances mean? Uh, what do they hinder? Um, they actually don't hinder anything when we recognize them. Uh, but we experience them as hindrances. And I want to add in, and I'm not the only teacher who teaches it this way, um, but I, I feel that that these five is a kind of a, it's kind of a number that is um, put on certain experiences, but we could throw in there, you know, let's let's just say, afflictive emotions. So uh, it could be envy or jealousy. It could be, it could be pride. It could be self-doubt. It could be self-judgment, judgment of others. I mean, all of these are, maybe they could fit somewhere into these five, but, but let's just say all of the afflictive emotions can be kind of put into the, 
the whole bowl of hindrances. And, and so what they hinder when, we're, when we don't recognize them is our clarity and our, our uh, capacity to be grounded and rooted in our chitta, in our heart, in the body. Uh, they, they interfere with our capacity to come home to ourself, to who we truly are. Um, they draw us into the illusion that we are separate, that we need to project and protect and defend ourselves in so many ways. Um, so they draw us into delusion. And, um, and so so the, the hindrances in this way are, are obstacles, um, obstacles to being present, obstacles to feeling uh, at home, at peace, uh, grounded, uh, in touch with who we, our deepest self, who we truly are. Um, and, and they are also, on the other hand, they're opportunities. They're opportunities to see, you know, what are these characteristic patterns that keep drawing me into these, these habits where I, you know, I, I feel lost, I feel, I feel separate, I feel isolated, I feel in opposition, I feel like I have to, um, like I don't belong, like nobody wants me, all of these stories that uh, come out of the causes and conditions of our lives and perpetuate our states of suffering. So there are opportunities to, to turn toward the suffering and, and open our hearts with compassion. You know, and, and in this, you know, and, and, and what is compassion? Compassion is an expression of love. It's an expression of, I care about this pain. I care about this suffering. I, I'll be here, I'm, I'm dear, dear one, whoever, if you, you could say your name, dear Daryl, I care about your suffering. I care about how you keep getting caught in these stories. And I, I really will be with you in this. And let's just stay present with with courage, with compassion, and with steadiness of heart. And, and see how, really see how this formation, this pattern is just something that is self-defeating, self-destructive. I'm done with this. I'm going to set this aside. Uh, even if I have to do it a hundred, a thousand, a hundred thousand times, I am in the direction now of setting this aside. And I want to read the, uh, the refrain. Um, because this is kind of just a, an expression of the practice. So in this way, one abides contemplating mind objects as mind objects internally. So this is what I've been talking about, our own practice. Or one abides contemplating dhammas as dhammas externally. So, so again, we can, we can see we can look around, we can, we can share uh, compassion for 
how the afflictive emotions are um, taking over someone in our circle of experience, in our, in our family, in our neighbor. We can share compassion for someone who's, who's experiencing loss and grief, um, share the suffering of that. Um, share someone who's experiencing a sense of not being enough, needing something to complete themselves um, and, and say, yes, I know that suffering. I've been there. Um, and, uh, and, and I, I guess I'm really expressing um, abiding, contemplating dhammas as dhammas internally and externally. So that's the, the piece of, yes, I know that, and I see that in you, um, and I'm with you with compassion. Or else one abides contemplating in mind not objects, their nature of arising, uh, dhammas, I mean, or abides contemplating in dhammas, their nature of vanishing, so, so important, their nature of arising. You know, sometimes we see them at the moment of arising. Sometimes when we turn towards them courageously, compassionately, kindly, steadily, we see how they move through like a, like a mind storm, like an energy storm, just uh, kind of that shakes us and then, and then, moves through. And then also in that moment of seeing the vanishing, how important it is to take in that spaciousness which is left behind, that quality of, of openness, of presence, that that the arising and the vanishing of a deluded mind state leaves behind presence, leaves behind awareness and, uh, and wisdom of knowing, having had insight into that process. Or else mindfulness that there are dhammas is simply established in one to the extent necessary for bare knowledge and, and mindfulness. So, so sometimes in meditation or in life, we have this quality of steadiness and, and we kind of just see it. <laughs> We see it arise and we, and we don't get caught. And, uh, and there are mind state, there are, uh, sorry, there are uh, mind objects, there are dhammas. So those dhammas could be anything. So in this, this kind of opening um, paragraph, you know, it's a kind of an introduction to the whole section that follows. So, so it could be afflictive states, it could be um, insights, it could be, you know, wisdom, could be um, ex uh, uh, um, um, the mental dimension of sensory experience or perceptions or whatever it is. Um, uh, for, to the extent necessary for bare knowledge and mindfulness, and one abides independent not clinging to anything in the world. And this is how Bhikkhu abides contemplating dhammas as dhammas in terms of the five hindrances. So, um, So I'd like us to move into meditation and I encourage you to practice with this and I'll offer some guidance 
and um, just recognizing the arising and the manifestation and the passing away, the vanishing of, you know, in particular, we're looking at hindrances. Um, you can also be aware of, of other dhammas that might come in. Um, so just recognizing dhammas as dhammas and in particular noticing when there are presence of any of the hindrances or afflictive states. And, and one of the things that, you know, a mark that helps us to recognize uh, an afflictive state as that is that there's a contraction, that there's a suffering attached to it. It may be subtle, um, but it's there. It's, it's, it's characterized by the presence of dukkha. So let's, um, so please, if, you, if you'd like to take a little moment to stand up and stretch, you can do that. Um, and then take a posture for meditation. So as we begin the practice, um, this formal practice of meditation, in whatever posture you are, um, sitting, lying down, standing, feel your body supported by the earth. and come home to the body in whatever way is most uh, supportive to you in this moment. Uh, feeling the breath. Feeling the whole body. Feeling the whole body breathing. And as we begin this practice, I invite you to bring an intention of compassion and friendship to yourself in this practice in relation to the arising of afflictive states, afflictive dhammas, afflictive mind objects, thoughts, emotions, imaginations, stories, self-concepts.
an intention rooted in deep compassion for ourselves to not turn away, to not judge, to not slam the door on these arisings, to get back to a more peaceful state of mind. We don't like the Vedna of afflictive states. They're unpleasant. We think that we're practicing to become more peaceful, to become more calm. And the persistent arising of these afflictive states is telling us that There's only one way toward a lasting peace, a lasting freedom, a freedom which is deeper than simply calmness. And that's through, it's through, it's turning toward, it's opening to and looking with clarity and compassion. At the, at the arising, first of all, seeing the nature of these states, of these mental objects or dhammas. Recognizing if, if you can, if you can look to the moment before the arising of this, look back at the moment before the arising of this thought or this grasping mind, grasping intention to what gave rise to it, what happened in that moment before. And then staying with it, staying with however it manifests, bringing that quality of investigation. You know, we're bringing the path factors into this. So it's, it's not explicitly mentioned, but we do bring, you know, the awakening factors into this mindfulness, investigation, energy. We bring that to this turning toward, to see through and to liberate ourselves from this hook that has been a source of suffering for so many years. We're changing our relationship with these hooks We're seeing them with a wisdom eye and a heart of compassion, a brave heart. And then coming back to this, to this space, to this stability, to the breath, to the body, to abiding in open awareness, abiding, simply resting in awareness. We may rest in awareness supported by a meditation object, such as the breath or the body. Or we may rest in simply 
awareness of awareness. I'll share an image of this experience of awareness of awareness that might be helpful that I was um, heard from Rinpoche, uh, Rinpoche, I'm not 100% sure I'm going to say his name right, so I'm going to not attempt. Um, and, um, and he said, when we light, when, there, when we are in a dark house and we have a lantern um, and we're holding up the lantern, we don't need a flashlight to illuminate the lantern. The lantern, as well as illuminating the objects around it, also is self-illuminating, illuminates itself. And so if we turn our attention toward that quality of knowing, that quality of awareness. There is a sense of abiding. There can be a sense as we, as we steady our attention and learn to abide there, there can be a sense of simply resting in that light of awareness. And that capacity to rest in awareness uh, is not only something that we can come to in practice and st stabilize ourselves in in practice. It is something that can become a kind of home. It can be our home as we live our lives, as we go about our daily life, that we're um, more and more knowing our true home to be that capacity to be aware and to know. And so, however our practice unfolds, turning toward Dhammas as they arise into awareness, bringing that light of awareness to what is arising in consciousness and seeing the arising and the passing away, resting in that open clarity, that simple knowing and presence.
as we come to the end of the meditation practice. Let's bring to mind the blessing of this practice. What, how has it nourished us? How has it, how have we uh, experienced insight, discernment, um, liberation, perhaps in the letting go? And really taking this in as a blessing. This is the blessing. This is the, the beauty, the grace that we receive from this practice. Uh, how beautiful. Can we share it? Can we send it out? Can we say this blessing, this, this beauty, I want others to, I want to share it. I want it to overflow perhaps to particular people, perhaps uh, in particular places, situations, um, a heartfelt dedication of merit to beings in realms of suffering and to beings also who are uh, thriving and enjoying life and perhaps benefiting other beings also. Perhaps those, some of those can come to mind as well. We'd like to share our blessing with. May the, the goodness the merit, the beauty of our practice. Serve and support the happiness, well-being, and liberation of all beings. <laughs>